And now we have arrived at the permitting reform session. Um, bring in the conversation. I know you've all been having off stage to the main stage, uh, so uh, I, I, won't, I won't prattle on. Um, let's just welcome our panel up to the stage. Uh, please welcome Jared, Marcella, Jeremiah, and Eli. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jared DeWeese. I'm the Deputy Director for Third Ways Climate and Energy Program. In August, Democrats in Congress passed the single largest investment in U.S. clean energy infrastructure in our nation's history the Inflation Reduction Act, in addition to passing bipartisan infrastructure funding the year before. It has been estimated that these two pieces of legislation, which are key components of Pre President Biden's climate agenda, will reduce U.S. emissions by 40% or more in the next decade. And in case you were concerned about the, the Biden administration missed any part of the clean energy value chain, Congress also passed the Bipartisan Chips and Science Act, increasing our ability to onshore domestic manufacturing and boost supply chains critical for the U.S. clean energy economy. This trifecta of legislation created nearly half a trillion dollars of clean energy funding, signaling that America is ready to lead on addressing climate change and ready to partner and support our allies as they respond to shifts in global energy demands and geopolitics. These historic pieces of legislation are filled with tax incentives for clean energy companies and not just wind and solar, but also nuclear, carbon capture, and hydrogen, and investments that will advance a federal buy clean program. There is also support for the Department of Energy's loan program office, which will help many emerging clean energy technology companies overcome financing obstacles, which are critical for cutting global emissions and boosting US competitiveness, as well as supporting the building out of the nation's electric vehicle charging infrastructure and upgrading and building new transmission lines. And that's not all. It's likely that this level of federal support will spur enormous investments from the private sector, making this not just monumental, but transformative. Decarb America, a third way bipartisan policy center and Clean Air Task Force Joint Policy Modeling Initiative, modeled many of the policies included in this troika of legislation and estimated if implemented right, could create millions of jobs by 2050 in every state. The benefits of a clean energy economy are clear and as challenging as the journey was to get to this point, now the real work begins to implement and build out this new modern economy. As I just listed a few of the wins packed into Biden's trifecta of clean energy legislation, you probably heard a lot of things that will need to be built, from charging infrastructure, transmission lines, wind and solar installation, DAC and hydrogen hubs, and if we want to reach net zero, the US will have to build these and more at an, at an unprecedented rate in the coming decades. Decarb America also estimated across all the policy scenarios that they modeled over the next 10 years, the US power sector will have to add at least 25 gigawatts of wind and solar. Wind and solar projects require a lot of land. And siting and social license have often restricted the build out of many of these projects. But if the US doesn't build out this over the coming decade, Decarb America estimates that in order to meet our goals, we will need 100 gigawatts of new nuclear and more than 60 gigawatts of additional gas with carbon capture. And these projects, some of which will also be new and come with their own set of obstacles to build out, largely due to the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, which, is also, which, is create, which was created to protect communities and the environment from pollution. But it gave, and it also gave the most vulnerable among us, a voice, who have been underrepresented for generations. In the more than 40 years since it was first enacted, NEPA has been America's environmental safeguard, making our cities and communities safer and preventing the extinction of countless species. But as we reconcile with a larger issue, global climate change, NEPA stands in the way of our best solutions, building out clean energy infrastructure and transitioning away from fossil fuels. Now the question is, how do we move forward? Is this policy really serving the people and the things that it was designed to serve and protect? And after a year of abundant policy legislation, does it actually hold us back from accomplishing the very thing it was designed to help the US do more of? And with both Republicans and Democrats in Congress and the Biden administration <laughs> seeking to reform, is either or any plan on the table equitable and practical? That's what my esteemed guests are here to discuss with you today. 
It's also not lost on me that this has been the focus of most of our conversations over the last two days. This issue touches just about every aspect of our lives, from energy and the environment, to housing, food security, and agriculture. And it's no wonder that it's captured not only the Beltway imagination, but all those concerned with the modern economy, the modern American and global economy. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Jeremiah Johnson. I am the founder and director of the Neoliberal Project, uh, recently rebranded as the Center for New Liberalism. Um, we are a group of uh, center-left, market liberal kind of uh, social media troublemakers and <laughs> activists. We have uh, chapters in 80 plus cities around the country and the world at this point, I think. Um, and I guess I wanna start by telling you a story about permitting. So in November 2016, uh, voters in Seattle went to the ballot box and one of the things they voted on was an expansion of the city's light rail system. And this got approved. Uh, they wanted to do this expansion. Light rail is good. Mass transit is good for the climate. Um, and it's almost six years later. We're almost at November 2022, and nothing has been built. In January of this year, <laughs> the city of Seattle and Sound Transit released an 8,000-page environmental impact statement that has taken that long to build, and, and this, was a, um, this was actually a draft version of that environmental impact statement. The final version is not expected to come out until late 2023, and at that point, their estimate is that $287 million will have been spent before a shovel hits the ground. So their current timeline is that in 2039, they, the actual uh, final expansion will actually be completed. And I think we can all agree, I think everyone on the panel and, and most people in the crowd are gonna agree that a 23 year timeline from voting into final completion is just kind of absurd. And the question is, how did we get here? Now, I actually had a version of this intro that was just me listing like 25 different examples of that. <laughs> um, I, I'm gonna spare you uh, the pain of listening to that, but know that they exist. The question I ask myself is, is why is it this way and does it have to be this way? And it, the answer we obviously come to is that it doesn't have to be this way because it didn't used to be this way. One of the interesting facts about NEPA is that um, it, you know, if you go back to the 1970s or 80s, you can find examples of environmental impact statements that were like 20 pages long. And it used to be a much quicker, more efficient process. And it makes you wonder why, how we got here and the answer that I have basically come up with is um, just the vibes have changed. For lack of a better term, if I was gonna use academic language, I would say that you know, the institutional culture of the agencies has adjusted, or you know, the, the court precedent and stare decisis has led to increased blah, 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 and you know, the institutional norms. But if, I, if I'm not gonna use academic language, I would just say that there's been a vibe shift. Um, and just kind of the, the collective knowledge inside a lot of these institutions and courts and agencies now kind of says collectively, well, common sense is that we have to have thousand page long environmental impact statements for big projects. And we all just kind of, that's the water that we're swimming in at this point. Um, and this kind of discretionary and vague nature of, of NEPA I've come to believe is really the core of the problem, that NEPA does not actually set a, a, a list of factual standards that you have to meet. You have to hit this numerical target for some specific thing. It's just a requirement that you accurately document the impact to the environment. And in you know, 1980, that meant a 20-page report, and now in Seattle, it meant in like an 8,000-page report. And Again, it's just a kind of collective decision we've all made to make that happen. But the good news is that if the vibe has shifted once, we can shift it again. Um, there's no text in NEPA that actually says anything about how long this process must take or how many pages you must write. Um, so when, when I talk to people who actually build things, what they typically tell me is that, you know, we don't care if standards are strict, we just want to know what they are. Like, give me a specific target to hit, and I will hit it, and then let me go build. 
and the, the kind of discretionary and vague nature of this process where you have to go plead your case and essentially a, a judge or a community activist will decide if they feel like you've done enough analysis is, is what frustrates the hell out of them. And so what I really believe about NEPA is that we have to move towards a rules-based and standards-based system of regulation that is not discretionary and is not based on kind of whatever the vibe in the room is at the time. You can kind of compare this to housing. You know, if, if you go to housing talks, there's a lot of discussion of as of right housing versus discretionary housing and how much more housing gets built under as of right kind of uh, uh, systems. And so I wrote a piece uh, a, about a month back called The Case for Abolishing NEPA. Now, as we all know, in the, uh, in the modern political discourse, abolish does not actually mean abolish. <laughs> abolish means significantly reform. That's what we've all learned in the last couple years. So in this sense, um, we should definitely, absolutely abolish NEPA. Um, in, in a more serious sense, I do think that, you know, a move, if we, if we change NEPA from a discretionary process to a standards-based process, that would be such a fundamental change of what NEPA is that I think it would be fairly called abolishing NEPA. It would probably require repealing the law and then replacing it with a, a different version of itself. And so, I, I'm, in that sense, I will argue that abolishing NEPA, I believe, would be a good idea, transitioning to a much different system. Um, one of the other things that I, I think would be interesting to talk about while we're on this panel is the idea of uh, community input, and, and you certainly hinted at this in your introduction, and I know that other members of the panel are gonna hint at this as well, but whether or not community input is good or helpful, and, and when it is good and helpful is, I think, a very open question at this point, and I'm excited to discuss it. Um, I, I, I do also wanna say, I think that you know, everyone on this panel is probably gonna agree on like 90% of issues. We may try to seek out like the 10% where we disagree, just to make it a little spicier. <laughs> but um, I, I think we all agree that there's a need for reform, and we agree on kind of some of the broad outlines of what that should look like. And I'm just excited to discuss all of this, community input and how it's gonna impact clean energy projects versus fossil fuels, how it's gonna impact marginalized groups, all of those things I think are very valid things to discuss and uh, looking forward to it. Thank you. All right, well, thank you. And uh, good morning, everybody. And uh, I'm Eli Dorado. Uh, I'm from the Center for Growth and Opportunity, and it's wonderful to be here uh, with you all, with these great panelists, um, and, and with, with all of you. Uh, and to see so many people uh, excited about the abundance agenda, or supply side progressivism, or progress studies, or it's time to build, or whatever. Uh, your version of this is. Um, for me, uh, many years ago, I self-consciously uh, shifted my research to the topic of ending the great stagnation. That was my framing for this thing that we're all doing. Um, and the poster child for stagnation was supersonic flight. Um, indeed, it was a case of actual technological regression because in 1976, you could buy a ticket from New York to London that would take you there in three and a half hours. And today, you can't do that. Um, so in 2016, uh, my friend Sam Hammond and I uh, published a paper on supersonics. And we made a simple point that you know, civil supersonic flight was banned over the US uh, since 1973 because of sonic booms. And the right policy answer is to have a noise standard rather than a speed limit. Um, and so that would let companies invest in low boom technology and, and you know, allow supersonic airplanes you know, to come back with access to a big market and, and so forth. And of course, being 2016, we called the paper Make America Boom Again. <laughs> um, so a few months after the paper came out, I got hired as head of policy at a startup that was developing a supersonic, uh, commercial supersonic uh, airliner. And in that role, I got to have a lot of very, uh, a lot of meetings with very high level officials at the Federal Aviation Administration. And so I asked them directly, I said, look, we've all read my paper. Uh, we know that the right answer on the supersonic ban is to repeal it and replace it with a noise standard, so why can't we do that? And they said, Eli, if we change the regulation, we'd have to do an environmental impact statement. And, we'd ha and we don't have any data on human response to sonic booms since the 1960s. And we know that Americans have gotten more sensitive to noise since then, and no matter what standard we put in the new regulation, uh, we'll get sued under NEPA. So, 
I want to make a small point here. This isn't a permitting question, right? This is, this is, uh, this is uh, NEPA is often thought of as a permitting law, but actually it's broader than that and applies to all federal decisions. Um, so that was my first real exposure to NEPA. That's what radicalized me. Um, and, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know that much about NEPA at the time. I filed it away, like, this is why we can't fly from New York to LA in two hours. Um, and, and, you know, now I'm not very political, uh, but intellectually and academically, I come from the libertarian, pro-market, public choice tradition. So it, it's not surprising to me that there could be a law that does bad things. It's like the least surprising <laughs> thing in the world. Um, but as I transitioned back into nonprofits and, and started working more on energy um, and, uh, issues specifically and industrial progress more generally, what surprised me is just how much I come across that NEPA affects. So if you're doing almost anything in the physical world, obviously anything involving infrastructure, building a power plant, high-speed rail line, transmission line, dredging a port, but also landing a spacecraft, uh, you know, legalizing supersonic flight over land, or implementing congestion pricing in Manhattan, right? Anything that requires a federal agency decision, like NEPA is gonna get in the way. So it affects everything, and NEPA is basically why we can't have nice things. Um, so I would like us to look, to think about NEPA reform through the lens, not only of permitting, yes, through permitting, but not only of permitting, but of federal decision making more broadly. Uh, if you look at it through the lens of permitting, NEPA is bad because there's uh, delays and risks for people who are building stuff. That's absolutely true. But if you remind yourself that NEPA affects all federal agency decision making, the situation is even worse than that because it means that we do not have effective federal agencies, right? Uh, think about what makes an organization effective. Uh, I think a big part of it is rapid, accurate, and reliable decision making, right? So if you think about it in these terms, NEPA makes our federal agencies extremely ineffective, and that is you know, notwithstanding the many talented and dedicated civil servants that, that uh, work in the agencies. So it's simply illegal for a federal agency to operate in a way that we would judge to be effective if we were evaluating literally any other organization, right? Um, and I think that there's a further like poisonous effect on agency culture, right? If almost nothing can be decided quickly, then like why ever hustle, right? Uh, like what signal does it send to federal employees that nothing ever gets done in a week? Like well, there's no rush, right? So, uh, so it's like the NEPA version of like the soft bigotry of low expectations. Um, and and you know, to bring it back full circle to the need to build stuff and decarbonize the economy, like if that's the goal, wouldn't it be great not only to have faster permitting times, but also to have you know, a federal bureaucracy that is efficient and effective and, and, and a good partner? Um, so I think this raises the question of like, what a successful reform to NEPA would look like. And basically, my view is that unless you solve a big fraction of this effective decision-making problem, uh, you're really missing the point, right? Like, we could do reforms that would take average EIS times from, like, five years to three years, right? And on one hand, that would be an incredible achievement. I think, I think that is actually, like, more than what people actually expect to be able to achieve uh, in, in, in reform. But on the other hand, it would continue to send the signal that we don't expect our federal agencies to actually be effective. Um, so a, a successful reform, to me, removes NEPA applicability from a significant fraction of federal decisions. Um, there are a lot of reforms that, that would help in this vein, but I don't think they're really on the table and certainly not in the, in the mansion text, for example. So, um, so I think a real like, structural NEPA reform along these lines would send the message that we expect our federal agencies to operate at a much faster cadence and that we expect them to accomplish big things or at least to enable big things. So, you know, what would it take to abolish NEPA? Um, like, I'm here on the panel, so uh, as a token libertarian, so I would be remiss if I didn't uh, talk about this. So, so anyway, I would support like actually abolishing NEPA. Uh, I would support abolishing it and replacing it with nothing. I would support abolishing it and replacing it with more stringent, substantive environmental protections, like Jeremiah suggests. Uh, I would support abolishing it and pairing it with, you know, uh, the whatever political bribes we need to assemble a coalition of 60 senators to do it. So, um, so I'm not really a politics guy, but I, I think it would be worth uh, us all working together to figure out you know, what that would look like and what, what we could do to make that work. So I will leave it there, and I look forward to 
the discussion. Thank you. Ellen? Now I want to take a supersonic flight. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Marcella Mulholland. I have slides. Can you see them? Are they? Oh, OK. I always, OK. I wasn't supposed to start off with that. Um, to start off, I'll give a bit of background on myself and the experiences that inform my perspective on permitting. I'm originally from the great swing state of Florida. I was supposed to <laughs> click the slide when I said that, but here we are. Um, uh, I grew up on the coast where I directly saw the impacts of climate change and I became politicized in college after Trump was elected. My sophomore year, I joined a then nascent and largely unknown youth climate group called Sunrise Movement. Don't be scared yet, hear me out. Um, I was part of the Green New Deal sit-in in Speaker Pelosi's office, and after college, I worked for the Century Foundation doing Green New Deal policy work. I am now, this is how left-wing I was, you guys, but again, hear me out. Um, BFFs is best friends forever for the non-Zoomers in the room. Um, I am now the political director at Data for Progress, a progressive think tank and polling firm. I think it's safe to say that I come from a different ideological background than my co-panelists and perhaps many of you here. And this is becoming the new norm for me. I believe this speaks to the moment of realignment that the climate movement is undergoing in the post-IRA world. Up until now, the climate movement has been focused on stopping fossil fuels while building momentum for federal legislation. But now that we have federal legislation, we actually need to build things, as we've been talking about over the last two days. Previously ignored divisions are now being pushed to the fore and making for some strange bedfellows in the permitting discourse. This last month, we saw House progressives side with the Senate GOP in opposition to the Mansion permitting deal. In Martha's Vineyard, the Koch brothers and the Kennedys came together to oppose building an offshore wind farm. I, a card-carrying DSA member who started my career in the fight for a Green New Deal, am on stage with the Libertarian and the founder of the Neoliberal Project because we all agree that the permitting status quo must change. Strange bedfellows indeed. Over the last several months, I have become obsessed with permitting. I made this meme to express that obsession. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I have wanted so desperately to find and read a progressive case for permitting reform from someone who shares my values, my EJ concerns, and also actually believes we're in a climate emergency, which means we should act as such. But I've been unable to find one. So if you can't find it, I guess you have to do it yourself. Or in my case, I work with an amazing team at Data for Progress. Shout out to Carly, Danielle, Sean, and Julia, who have worked closely to help think through what a progressive approach to permitting reform looks like. If not us, who? If not now, when? So I would like to briefly outline what I view as the progressive case for permitting reform. And to briefly I, you know, define progressive, because people use it differently, I come at this as someone who understands the identity progressive to mean someone who embraces progress, supports the expansion of economic and civil rights, and favors the needs of the many over the interests of the few. All of these values are precisely what bring me to believing that we desperately need to reform, improve, and expedite the permitting process in the United States. I break my argument down into three parts. The first is climate, and without getting too into the weeds, I am not a regulatory nor NEPA expert, but we can get into abolishing NEPA, which it seems like my co panels want to. Um, I think everyone can agree that climate change is a problem. We should reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Thankfully, Congress just acted by passing the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, wait, that's not what I wanted. Okay, we passed the Inflation Reduction Act. Oh, this is when I was shouting out my teammates. Okay, we passed the Inflation Reduction <laughs> Act, and um, modeling shows that the bill will lead to a 40% reduction in emissions compared to 2005 levels by 2030. Critically left out of this 40% headline that everyone has been citing is the caveat that this modeling assumed quick siting and build out of clean energy projects. That is, in fact, a very big assumption to make. As we speak, there are thousands of megawatts of clean energy entangled in the permitting process. And in a follow-up report, the REPI project found that 80% of projected emissions reductions would be lost if transmission build-out and siting happened at our current rates. 
I would encourage folks to read the fine print because they say things that are important. And if, <laughs> if we take a look at a specific sector, the US currently has only 42 megawatts of offshore wind in operation and a little over 900 megawatts under construction with more than 18,000 megawatts tied up in the permitting process. The climate investments in the IRA are critical, but they're not enough. We need to unlock the impact of those investments by making it easier to build. I care about permitting because I care about climate change. The second is housing. As we talked about, oh, this is the wind and energy thing. Um, as we talked about yesterday, cities across the nation are facing housing shortages that are leaving thousands of Americans housing insecure, with many resorting to living on the streets. I know many people here live in cities like New York City and San Francisco that have seen an influx of unhoused people, disproportionately black and brown, many veterans in their community over the last several years. An insufficient supply of affordable housing is a key cause of this, and it turns out that the permitting process, in many instances, local and state zoning rules, is being exploited by so-called NIMBYs and sometimes even enviros, who are usually wealthy and usually white, who are invested in making it harder to build more housing. I care about permitting because I care about affordable housing for all. Lastly, and perhaps a bit more existential, I, as a progressive, care about permitting because I care about making government work well. This is not the image of government working well. You can't read it, but this is how you go through NEPA. The permitting status quo, yeah, is not the image of government working well. And the progressive movement, myself included, have no shortage of big, bold, transformative policy ideas. We want government-run health care. We want pre-K for all, paid family leave, a Green New Deal for schools, for cities, for the whole damn country. And all of these ideas hinge upon having reliable and efficient government institutions. Progressives who have big dreams for government action should be in favor of reforms that increase state capacity. Moreover, the success of our policy goals is determined by our ability to persuade voters that the government is actually capable of providing goods and services in a timely and effective manner. I care about permitting because I care about the role of government in people's lives. To close, in the 60s and 70s, the environmental movement found success aligning itself around what we opposed, as we've discussed over the last two days. It was enough to build your legal strategy against, uh, oriented around what you were against. Um, and it's often the leaders of that era of the movement whose views inform some of the most ardent opponents to the current permitting discourse. And while I find their views frustrating, I would encourage us to not look back with hostility, but with gratitude. Many of the laws born out of that worldview, like the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, and yes, the National Environmental Policy Act, have saved lives. They they've led to significant improvements in the US's air and water quality. And yet, despite these good, there are parts of these laws that allow the wealthy few to work against the needs of the many and are now obsolete. Individuals and communities that have rarely had to bear the burden of infrastructure projects are exploiting these laws to continue to resist contributing their fair share. The worldview that created these laws was in some cases useful, but no longer meets the needs of the movement. That is okay, that's what happens when there is progress. So let's look back with a degree of humility and look forward toward a new vision for the environmental movement where we continue to improve air and water quality, where we provide Americans with affordable energy, and where we do what it takes to decarbonize. I hope you will build with me. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella, for showing that diagram of NEPA. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a bedrock environmental policy that ensures two things. One, that agencies look before they leap, and two, it in, if not ensures, it provides a framework for democratic federal decision-making our process. The NEPA review process is not just box checking, or it shouldn't be. It is often the only tool people have to raise their voices in projects that may threaten ecosystems or harm endangered species, impact homes, war, water, and air quality, health, and surrounding communities. When we're talking about reforming, that's an important aspect that must, that could be impacted. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the fact that there is not a representative of an environmental justice group on this panel. And as far as I know, none of us are from or live in one of those communities. But Marcella, Data for Progress has meaningful relationships with EJ groups. What are you hearing from them and their major concerns around NEPA or the permitting reform? 
Yeah, so I think with the most recent mansion permitting side deal, the first legislative text that came onto the scene was watermarked with the American Petroleum Institute, which isn't exactly a great intro to, for EJ communities. I would suggest that maybe next time we do like a GND or DSA watermark, <laughs> maybe a BTI watermark, I don't know. Um, and so I think it's understandable that these groups would initially have a bad reaction to this. And I think also the feeling on the left post IRA was that you know a lot of these groups were excluded from the process. Everyone was except Joe Manchin and Chuck Schumer. <laughs> um, but I, I think these communities' perspective is that for so long their needs have been ignored and NEPA has felt like the one and only legal pathway to address their grievances. I will say, like some of my co-panelists probably want to get rid of some of the environmental justice protections that exist, and I would just encourage folks who you know suggest that we get rid of environmental justice protections to maybe have a glass of water in Jackson, Mississippi right now. Like there are very real concerns that these communities have, and um, Cancer Alley is a real thing. I live in New York City. The South Bronx has the highest asthma rates in the country. And so there's, a real, there's real trauma in these communities from environmental harm. And so I would just encourage folks, you know, we're frustrated, we want to build more quickly. Like, I understand all of that. But like, when we react and talk to these people, it needs to come not from a place of like condescension and, and patronizing, but rather understanding that they feel so strongly because there has been legitimate harm. Right. And let's continue down that path. Um, Jeremiah, NEPA's considerations for public comment and public engagement arose from legitimate issues that Marcella just mentioned, especially low-income and communities of color, the, commu the issues that they faced. Do you have any concern for stripping the right of communities to weigh in on projects that may concern them? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, we should start out by, by acknowledging that you know, the history of America is just littered with massive injustices that have been done to all sorts of different groups. And we should recognize that and, and make an effort not to do that anymore. Um, that's, that's the baseline which we're all operating from. But one of the concerns I have when I look at things like the environmental justice movement is thinking about just the general question of, you know, who represents marginalized communities? If we take a, a recent example from New York, where I also live, you know, in, in the wake of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, there was a lot of groups that wanted to speak for certain communities on the issue of criminal justice. And then uh, about a year later, black and brown voters in New York overwhelmingly elected, you know, Eric Adams as mayor of New York, who was the former cop who promised to be tough on crime. So the issue of who actually spoke for those voters um, was kind of an open question. And what, what I worry about is whether or not we're, we're speaking for those communities or speaking for those communities by way of in order to support this community, you must adopt my agenda. Um, there's also just the basic question of whether NEPA does anything for these communities. You know, the, the history of America, as I said, is littered with injustice, but those injustices continued through the NEPA era. NEPA's been around for quite a while now, and it's not like we've solved the, the marginalization issues that we're talking about. Um, and I think functionally what NEPA does is it empowers a very different set of people. It empowers a set of wealthy people who are often not marginalized in any sense to kind of abuse the process for their own ends. You know, if we're talking about the many versus the few, I, I think NEPA very much empowers the few rather than the many. And so there are other systems we could use to actually help people. And on some level, we just have to think about, you know, do we care about the outcome or do we care about the process? Mm -hmm. Because, you know, like, just as, as one example, and I'll, I'll just throw this out there, like the, the most impacted people by climate change, probably by far, will be the islanders who live on, on islands where like if the sea level goes up by 20 feet, the island ceases to exist and literally their homeland will be gone forever permanently. But in a sense, it's important to know that, but I don't think we would actually like make better policy if we had like a, a bunch of islanders at the table because we know what the policy levers are. We just have to do it. We have to get the job done rather than talk about getting the job done mm -hmm. extensively in meeting after meeting. So 
I don't want to dismiss the very valid concerns about marginalization that have happened, because that, that is what America's history is, but I just want to make sure that we're attacking the problem and not talking about the problem. Right. So Eli, you've talked about a full repeal, even in your opening remarks and, and the things that you, you know, have discussed publicly. What does a NEPA repeal look like for building, you know, for building out for environmental protection, and specifically for marginalized communities? Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> so first of all, environmental harm is very, very real, right? Like, I think we all agree uh, mm -hmm. it's a problem. And so the question is, how do you uh, remediate the harm, right? And, and so if uh, people in Jackson, Mississippi, you know, need new water infrastructure, we got to build new water infrastructure, right? So it's, again, we're building. And, mm -hmm. and, and to put it through, the, you know, the new water infrastructure through the NEPA process and delay it by several years because of all the construction uh, kicking up dust, all the diesel emissions, et cetera, that come along with construction. Um, that is just, you know, delaying environmental justice. So I think Jeremiah actually hit it on the head uh, where, you know, probably the best way to repeal the law is to replace, you know, to come up with a suite of more stringent substantive environmental protections that will um, clean up the air, right, will reduce asthma in New York, will, um, you know, will, will clean, clean, keep the water clean, right? Um, it's amazing, like, the Clean Water Act is amazing, right? Like, we have, like, dolphins in New York Harbor now, right? And that's <laughs> not because of NEPA, right? That's because of, like, substantive protections. Um, and and so, so that's the, I think that needs to be the approach that we take is, is, you know, strictly on the substantive and not raising new, uh, new hurdles that slow down agency decision making, that slow down permitting, that add risk and uncertainty, that add costs, that make projects more difficult to finance, uh, et cetera. Can I throw in a couple more examples there? Just, yeah. I mean, because the environmental movement has had some really big wins, but they typically come with a specific, like, factual standard that you have to meet, specific number of a specific chemical. You know, we, yeah. we've solved acid rain. That's not a thing. I was talking to a Zoomer the other day, a 19-year-old, who literally <laughs> didn't know what acid rain was. Um, and it's just, it hasn't been a thing for a while. You know, the, the hole in the ozone layer is clearing itself because we banned what chlorofluoro, whatever it's called. <laughs> I'm not a scientist. But like these are, these are examples of huge victories that we should thank environmentalists for that are like factual standards and not about a process and a bunch of meetings we had, but just that chemical's bad, it's gone. The hole in the ozone layer is healing. So, you know. And the more we learn about air pollution, like the more we learn about how terrible it is. Yeah. Right? Like and, and so like let's let's do something about that rather than you know uh, putting handcuffs on everybody and, <laughs> and say like okay you got to build this uh, new infrastructure with handcuffs on. Can I just that build my... on oh, what ahead, Jeremiah please. mentioned? Yeah. I think there's a real problem here where folks uh, just overuse the term community. Everyone's like community and put this. Communities want this. Communities don't want this. Everyone knows what communities want. And it's usually like Ivy League degree white people living on in coastal cities, and um, there's so much you know political rhetoric that's based off of the claim that like this is what's good for low income communities of color. This is what low income communities of color want. And I actually think there are some uncomfortable instances, like Jeremiah mentioned, black voters in New York City overwhelmingly voted for Eric Adams, who delivered Joe Biden the nomination in the primary, black voters in South Carolina. They didn't, you know, roll up for Bernie Sanders and democratic socialism, right? So like, we should acknowledge that. And it's, you know, should encourage humility for folks. And for me, makes me want to have a more rigorous understanding when people say community. And I think polling can play a really important role here in just encouraging a data-backed definition, right? Like, it's actually an answerable question, like, what do black voters think about NEPA and environmental review? Like, you can do polling on this. You can see how they vote in elections. And our polling shows that the majority of voters do support making it easier to build. They also support NEPA and environmental reviews for federal actions. And um, I think there's just a more complicated version of community that I would encourage people to push back on when you hear that claim. Um, community is not just like the most left-wing ideological person in a place who claims to represent the community. Yeah. Um, and then on the point of abolishing NEPA, I would just say, <laughs> um, NEPA is an umbrella law. It helps project developers know which statutes and rules and regulations their actions are triggering. 
And I think, with all due respect, libertarians, like, I envy you because if I just felt like government was the problem for everything, I feel like I would sleep more peacefully at night. Um, <laughs> but I think there's just an oversimplification here where it's like, oh, this thing is complicated and it's not working well, let's just get rid of it. And that actually is an abdication of engaging with the tougher problem, which is like, there are real needs for regulation in some instances. We need to reform the process. We need to build enduring and empowered institutions and agencies that can actually build things long term. And that is, for me, the conversation that I'm more interested in having as opposed to just like wishing away the problems that are more difficult. Because actually just wishing away NEPA doesn't build things. Like you need to go beyond that, which it seems like you guys are open to as well. But um, I just would encourage people to not oversimplify a problem that is actually hard and very much worth engaging in a rigorous discussion of how do we fix NEPA. Um, and also, from the pollster perspective, I feel an obligation to say this, like, political viability of proposals is a real dynamic here. And in the Trump administration, uh, he proposed significant rollbacks of NEPA and was unable to really garner significant political appetite for that, even among Republicans. And so I just would say, like, in terms of keeping us grounded in what's politically viable, like, I don't know that abolishing NEPA is really on the table from that perspective. Let's talk a little bit about that, the political viability of different proposals. I mean, we've heard the Manchin proposal. Senator Capito has a proposal. Uh, Representatives Gerhalva and McKeachin had the Environmental Justice for All Act, which is something that I'm also hearing as a, as a thread here. Like there needs to be protections there, but also some way to build out. Uh, you know, do, is this gonna be done at one time? We were in the permitting reform breakout yesterday where we, people said it's gonna be different things. Is that true or, or will we be able to do this in a Defense Production Act? I mean, I, I don't know the future. I can tell you what I would like to happen. But, right. well, what is that? Um, I mean, so uh, the way I think that is both a, a potentially practically viable way for reform to happen and also a good thing that would happen um, is, is not just we're going to abolish NEPA and it goes away forever. And, and Eli maybe wishes that was the case. But politically, that, that's not going to be the case. I look at the success of the YIMBY movement in California recently and they started with like one small bill a few years back that finally got passed. Scott Wiener had, had posted like uh, four different versions of this before it finally got passed in one year. And then after that, there was kind of a second one and a third one. And like this year, there was a whole tidal wave of them, it seemed. And the YIMBY movement has just kind of piece by piece been building little victories together. And I think that that is potentially a viable path forward, that we get a mansion permitting deal. And then, you know, it mostly applies to energy in, in this sense. But as Eli points out, permitting is, is really important for a lot of different things. And so, you know, maybe that provides us momentum to next year tackle permitting from a different angle. And we, we have that moment of we do lots and lots of things. Maybe individually they're small, but collectively they add up over time. That's something that would make me very hopeful and I think is possible. The other possibility is that we pass one thing and everybody moves on and is like, well, we did permitting and now we're not going to touch it for another 30 years. And, and I think that would be disastrous because I don't think the type of permitting reform we need is going to be solved in one bill, unless it's kind of the entire repeal the whole thing and replace it with something else. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so, so I, I agree it's like not politically viable <laughs> to abolish it, but I, I, I think it's the right answer, so I feel like I need to say it anyway. <laughs> like somebody needs to say the true thing. Um, and so let me, I want to respond to just a couple things that uh, you guys have said. So, so one is the claim that like NEPA is an umbrella law, right? And I've heard this argument a lot and not just from Marcella. Um, and, and therefore, you know, we can't, it doesn't actually work to repeal NEPA because it's used to comply with a lot of other laws. And so like as an argument, like I would give this like three Pinocchios. Right, like, like I it wouldn't get four Pinocchios because like there is some truth to like there, like they, people do use the NEPA process to also comply with other laws, but there's also this thing called a categorical exclusion, right? And so things that have been well studied by agencies, they do a CADEX, and you you are exempted from uh, a more stringent environmental review, and somehow we are able to comply with all the other substantive laws that are under the umbrella, right? So the fact that we can like the umbrella doesn't seem to be necessary for us to be, be able to comply with all these other laws. So like, so we actually just don't really need it. Um, and then 
uh, you said the Defense Production Act. What's interesting to me is that the Defense Production Act does not have a waiver for NEPA. So like the asteroid could be coming, right? Mm -hmm. Like we're gonna go do the, the asteroid redirect mission and guess what? Like we're gonna be stuck in like five years of environmental review uh, <laughs> for it. And so that's the real like don't look up right. um, movie, right? Uh, there, is a, there is an exemption under, uh, for, under FEMA for the, for the Stafford Act. So, so you'd have to do it under that. Okay. Uh, that, that statute. Um, but I think that, like, it's just, so I, I'm passionate about, like, let's, let's just get rid of this, because I, I, I agree with Marcella that we need government to do uh, things. It's not, I, and I agree we need regulation. Um, so really, like, I'm, I'm playing the libertarian here, but I'm pretty moderate as far as libertarians go. <laughs> um, but it's just so bad, you guys. Like, uh, so, so like, uh, we we just heard from uh, we just heard from Tim Latimer from Fervo, right? And he's such a great ambassador for the for the geothermal industry. Um, but the kinds of NEPA reviews that that they have to go through, right? So, so like, in, in principle, to like lease land for geothermal drilling uh, on federal land, like maybe you have to do like two environmental assessments. The agency has to do two environmental assessments before the lease is done. Um, then there has to be a categorical exclusion to drill a temperature gradient well. Then there has to be another environmental assessment to drill an exploration well. Then there has to be another environmental assessment to drill a production well. And then you want to bring all the turbines in and do the construction and connect it to the grid, and there's an environmental impact statement. So that's, you know, six NEPA reviews, right? It's like if you say two years for each environmental assessment and five years for the environmental impact statement, it's 13 years of delays. Or to build a geothermal plant on federal land, it's just insane. And like, enough is enough. Hmm. I mean, there's no question that those timelines are unacceptable. I think for anyone who cares about climate change, it's extremely concerning, and you know, makes me feel like the IRA passing is really just the beginning, and we have decades ahead of actually fighting, maybe with environmental groups themselves to build these things, uh, which will be interesting. Um, to your question, Jared, of like, is there a one bill solution? Like, I would just say, like, we need permitting reform, not just for building energy infrastructure. Obviously, this is a climate conference, so we're focused on that. Housing is one example of this, um, but there are other sectors that also need permitting reform. So I would say there isn't kind of a one bill solution here. In terms of attaching it to the DPA or NDAA at the end of this year, or in lame duck, people have been asking about that. I'm, first of all, I'm like anxiously attached to Joe Manchin. My fear of abandonment is real. I have no idea what's gonna happen with him, but I'm on the edge of my seat to see if he can get something done. I personally was um, disappointed to see the bill die because I think the transmission provisions were so important. Um, to the, the moral hazard argument of like, oh, if we do something, then we'll be like, oh, we did permitting. I'm like American politics is so fickle and like getting a democratic trifecta is so rare and permitting is like so fragile with coalition dynamics. I feel like if you have the opportunity to move the needle forward, like you need to go guns blazing full steam ahead and you know the parts of it that we're, we're not able to get to now, like you know build, passing something will build momentum to continue to do that in the future. I think Fast 41, I was in like fifth grade when that passed, but I'm hearing a lot about it. Seems very important. Um, and I was happy to hear, I really was in, I'm not joking. Um, and so I'm happy to hear that people have been thinking about this for a long time, but I, I think we'd certainly have a responsibility to take a bite at the apple now. And to your point, Jared, also about the EJ for All Act, this is, so when I was looking, I was looking for like where are the progressives on this? Like I need, where are my climate progressives on permitting? Where is their bill? And I was pointed to the EJ for All Act. And to my knowledge, please correct me if I'm wrong, there are no parts of the EJ for All Act that would actually make permitting happen faster. Um, if that, I really would hope that I'm wrong, so please tell me if I am. But, um, and right. then also a lot of these EJ groups will say like, well, the question is capacity and like we just need to give the government agencies more money and more staff to do it better. The IRA gave $750 million to NEPA. And so I'm like, okay, if that's the problem, then like we did the solution for that, like let's see the results, right? And like, I don't know that we will. 
Um, I do think we need to give agencies more staff capacity to like hire people to do things quicker. Um, but I don't think that it's enough. And I would point people to Senator Whitehouse's CITE Act, which focuses on transmission, but is from a climate champion who, from my perspective, has like the most robust um, legislation on the table for improving and expediting the permitting process for transmission specifically. Yeah, you touched on my next question about staffing. I mean, IRA provided what, $750 million for the implementation of, oh, let, me see, let me go back to this. So do you, you see the same thing happening with IRA that happened with the Recovery Act? So the Recovery Act was poised to fund much needed job creating for infrastructure projects. Right, and so we just talked about how much IRA did that, but environmental reviews under NEPA stalled many of those. So we didn't see many projects get built out under the Recovery Act because of NEPA. Um, the, Recover the Inflation Reduction Act provides over $750 million for the implementation of NEPA, as well as $25 million for the Office of Management and Budget Oversight and the Governmental Accountability Office oversight, <laughs> each to provide transparency on how the larger package is enacted and allow the public to ensure it delivers on environmental justice priorities. Are we going to see the same thing with IRA that we saw under the Recovery Act, where it's going to actually stall it, even with more staff? I hope everyone in this room fights like hell so that that's not the case. I mean, I hope not, yeah. I don't have a detailed answer here, but I, I hope that the IRA moves forward fast. And, and the only thing I'll say about staffing is that if we were writing 20-page reports and not 1,000-page reports, I think we would, the staffing would not be a problem. Right. So the, the man hours needed are you know, not independent of how long the, the reports are. So. Right. I think another dynamic here, and I think Jennifer mentioned this in the briefing yesterday, or some, like we need to get the staff at the agencies to buy into this as well. Because if you just have a top down like rule change where you're like, you've been writing 8,000 pages, now write 10 pages. And in four years, there will be another president who has a totally different agenda. It's like, I don't know how actually resilient or enduring those changes are. Um, so, and, and it also, again, I feel like oversimplifies things, like shortening the time for judicial action, I think is probably good. And a lot of these groups like Earth Justice, like have multi-million dollar budgets and like dozens of lawyers who are experts in NEPA on staff. And like, if they wanna file a lawsuit, they'll do it in 150 days. They're not gonna miss the deadline. Um, so I think, you know, getting buy-in at the agency staff level and then just thinking about the fact that these groups have done this for years and they will find a way to continue to do so makes me see those proposals in a different light. You're saying we need a vibe shift. We do need a vibe shift. <laughs> I really resonated with that, Jeremiah. I really did. I think that you know, having more staff, I think that actually could like push individual reviews through faster, but it like still doesn't like it's still going to be limited in terms of like how much faster you can really go. Mm -hmm. And I think it doesn't address um, the uncertainty that will be uh, brought on by further litigation, right? Like, so the, I totally support, uh, uh, I agree with you that um, like shortening the window for, for a judicial challenge would be great, but it doesn't solve all the problems, right? Like, uh, there was a, a wind farm, there was a NEPA lawsuit on a wind farm uh, that was pushed by a solar company, right? It's for, for like public choice mm -hmm. reasons, right? Um, so, it, and I think also the incentives, I think why we see the environmental, like, sort of like the legacy environmental groups um, uh, so supportive of, you know, so opposed to any change to NEPA is because actually, like, there's a public choice reason there too, right? This is actually their fundraising mechanism, right? They, they sue a project, they sue a geothermal plant in Nevada because of a spe species that is not on the endangered species list. Right, and then they then they sent out a fundraising email saying we're suing to stop this big energy project to save a to save the spotted toad, right? And and so it's like you're you're we're cutting at straight at their funding uh, fundraising mechanism if we if we you know, eliminate these environmental reviews. And so that, that's like the another like nefarious aspect that's like completely unaddressed, which is something you've all touched on that you know NEPA might not be protecting the people that it was designed to protect that it's really protecting moneyed interest, 
which and many fossil fuel interests in that case, right? I mean, Jeremiah, you've touched on this. Uh, you you critique both sides of the building debate, that those that want to build clean energy projects faster and those that want to build oil and gas infrastructure faster. You've argued that the burden does not fall on these types of projects, clean energy versus fossil fuels, equally. Why is that? Um, so, fundamentally, anything that makes it hard to build new things is going to be biased towards the status quo. It's prejudiced towards what we already have. What we already have is a mostly fossil fuel energy system. And so when somebody, you know, protests that, well, if you do this reform, it's going to make it easier to build fossil fuels, I'm like, sure. Okay. That, I, I accept that as an accurate statement, but I still think we should go forward for, you know, a, a whole bunch of reasons. Like, just to list them off quickly, like, number one, the specific natural gas pipeline that Joe Manchin wants is potentially even good because it might be displacing coal in Virginia. It might allow us to, you know, because things are fungible to some extent, ex export more natural gas to Europe where it's displacing coal mostly and Russian natural gas, which is, you know, three times as dirty as our natural gas because they don't give a shit if they put methane into the air. You know, their pipelines are super leaky. Number two, we should go forward with you know, this because it's what Joe Manchin wants and he just delivered you half a trillion dollars of clean energy spending. So to borrow a line from um, like Matt Iglesias is give him what he wants. You know, don't stab him in the back after he just gave you this. That's basic politics. I, I also just think the cost curve of you know, clean energy is going to outcompete. You know, if we make it easier for everything, the, the, the future is solar and wind and, and other renewable projects, and the cost curve is going to show that. So I'm not scared of letting them compete on a truly level playing field. And the level playing field really matters because the final point I would make is that a lot of fossil fuel projects are already getting like exemptions or waivers under you know, our current system where they don't have to go through the same stringent process that actually like new renewables would have to go through. And it's just insane how many ways we're already biased towards fossil fuels. So just let them compete evenly, and I'm confident what the outcome will be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or I would even say add a carbon tax, right? I know that's like controversial <laughs> in this room. Um, but uh, so uh, one, one other point I wanted to make um, is that, okay, like abolishing NEPA is like the libertarian position, right? But the way we cope with NEPA without abolishing it is actually to do even more libertarian stuff, right? So. We could sell off the federal lands, right? Like, you wouldn't have to go through NEPA if you wanted to drill a geothermal well on the land if it wasn't federally owned, right? We could take a lesson from Yimbis, as you mentioned, and like do stuff by right, right? In the libertarian world, we call that freedom, <laughs> right? Just let, let you do stuff on your own property or whatever, right? We could reduce agency discretion. We could have Congress like specify more clearly under what conditions agencies would have to authorize certain actions. And so, so if the agency doesn't have discretion, then NEPA doesn't apply, right? That's what the courts have held. Um, and you could have Congress do things directly, right? You could have Congress like repeal the supersonic ban uh, directly. If, if, if FAA does it, you have to go through an EIS. If Congress does it, you don't. So, you know, all of these suggestions, like, like I think there is uh, an extent to which I think we have to be like sort of like bugged by libertarian reality here and say, like, if we want to, if we want to do this stuff, we've got to, um, we've got to, we've got to make that possible. Marcella, you shrugged at the I just, I'm not feeling mugged by the libertarian reality personally, <laughs> but um, <laughs> I just want to fully echo what Jeremiah said about, um, you know, the permitting reforms that are on the table, they might make it easier to build all kinds of energy, but as a good climate progressive, I thought clean energy was already winning in the market, and I thought that was the future, so if you make it easier to build anything, won't clean energy win? That's what I thought, as a good liberal. Um, and I also just wanna say it would be great if the clean energy industry and actually project developers could be more active in the political conversations around this, because I think the enviros and the climate movement will be put in a tough position if you have actual project developers who are trying to build utility scale solar and wind saying like this is what we need to change. And um, to Eli's point about the toads and there's like endangered tortoises and like God knows what, 
Like, I, God bless them, like, I really, I don't really care that much about the toads and the tortoises <laughs> that are stopping the build out of these things, and I say this as someone who, you know, cares a great deal about biodiversity loss and, like, thinks it's really sad that the polar bears are going extinct, and it is precisely because of that that I think we need to decarbonize quickly, and it's a question of like local versus global impacts where it's like, okay, this one toad will like have a harder time building a habitat versus like, do we let the whole planet reach degrees of warming that make it more difficult for millions of species to exist on earth? Um, so I don't give a shit about the toads and tortoises. We need to build clean energy. But we do give a shit about human beings, of course. <laughs> And we do care about engagement. And I think a lot of this is about engagement with communities. And I think that's a wonderful place for us to end today. Thank you, panelists. Oh, questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot there was a question and answer. We do we're have time. With the no, we're engaging, engaging with yeah. the community. <laughs> Not off the hook yet, y'all. Um, so we'll do our thing and take two or three questions at a time, and then the panel can react to whichever they want. We'll start over here. Hi, Kristen Eberhard from the Scannon Center. So there's a lot of focus on communities, and Marcella really made a clear case for the left of why we care about building for climate and housing and equity. But what about the case to the right? <laughs> And what about, you know, why are Republicans didn't show up for Manchin's bill? And Republicans should care about freedom and about building and about business. And they weren't the ones who showed up and they weren't the ones blocking it. So I th feel like there's a lot of focus on convincing the left. But what about convincing Republicans? And we'll take right here, Sharon. Yeah, um, this is, I, normally I would give questions, but I might be the only actual NEPA nerd, well, okay, in the, in the audience here, and I just have to say, categorical exclusions are part of NEPA. Mm -hmm. yep. They're in the regulations. Um, I go back to section 101, harmony between humans and the environment. There's lots of ways, technical ways to achieve that. And finally, I'd just like to say, um, please involve, when you come up with ideas for improving the way NEPA is conducted in federal agencies, please involve the NEPA communities in federal agencies in developing ideas. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon. And Shelley, you had a question? Um, sh this is a fascinating discussion. Um, NEPA is a decision-making tool. It can be used constructively to make decisions. Um, Admiral Watkins from the Navy said, thank God for NEPA, because otherwise we would have weapon systems that didn't do the job. Um, I, the only thing I didn't hear from you all, and I heard a lot of fascinating things, is that I'm not sure you guys understand that NEPA is a, a social and economic and an environmental statute. Let's use it right. It can be done. And I'm so sorry that you're hearing the NEPA people say, um, no. uh, don't attack the law, make it work. The one other thing to answer your question is the reason that the Republicans didn't support Manchin is number one, they were punishing him. And number two, the utilities asked them not to do it. The utilities who were going to benefit from the transmission, just FYI. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll do another round, but maybe the panel can respond first. Yeah. Um, the Republican response, or you want to you want to take that? Someone you want to take that question, Marcella? I don't. I don't know why Republicans. <laughs> do I feel like do. it's been accurately answered. I'm, I'm yeah. not like closely connected to Republican world, but my understanding is just that Joe Manchin pulled a fast one on them with regards to pushing one thing through reconciliation and then or, and getting another thing through when they thought it wasn't going to go through, and mm -hmm. you know. Got, got one by Mitch McConnell, and so now we're going to punish him. And I don't think it's a whole lot more complicated than that. Right. <laughs> or mad that he didn't join the Republican caucus, right? <laughs> also, I'm, I'm with the NEPA folks. Like, we need to talk to the people who are actually implementing the law. We need to make it better. It's a tool. We can choose how we use it. Great. More questions? I think we have one over here. Hey, uh, Brian Hamlin, California EMB. Uh, thanks, uh, Jeremiah, for recognizing all of our uh, winning of late. <laughs> um, a question for Marcella. Uh, so uh, I've, I've gone on a similar political 
journey as you have, um, and it can sometimes uh, be uh, fr frustrating. Can you give us uh, some hope and apologies for doubling down on the uh, how do we convince the left? But what sort of receptions have you been getting from your allies in the in like the the climate movement to permitting reform? Have you found certain messages or arguments? Um, that are particularly persuasive or certain coalition partners that you think are, are necessary to have a, a breakthrough there? And bef before we get to that, we'll get a couple more. Hi, a couple of you have made the modest proposal of replacing the procedural standards in NEPA with substantive standards. And I'd like to just hear you play that out a little bit more. So what are some of the substantive criteria to which agency decisions and or infrastructure um, decisions should be applied? One more from Alan. Um, you, you made mention at one point about how well, we just need to get things done to help communities, but it seems to me that there's a difference between getting things done when a community feels like it has participated and getting things done when a community feels like it hasn't participated, even if the end is the same. In other words, like vaccines that are distributed without having previously talked with people versus vaccines that are distributed when you have talked with them. So I'm wondering how you're gonna integrate empowerment of individuals on the ground as, as part of the process while also avoiding the kinds of delays that seem to be so problematic? I, I can start out with that one, I guess. Um, so I guess I just, I'm, who I am is an outcome-focused person. And I, I kind of fundamentally think like, it, is there a, if the outcome is the same, do we really need the, the input? The vaccine thing is interesting because that requires a level of individual choice and individual participation. Um, and so their community outreach is, is vital because we've got to convince you know, millions of people one by one by one to actually make a specific individual choice. Whereas something like, I'll go back to the acid rain example, acid rain disproportionately affected marginalized communities, communities of color, poor people, but we didn't solve it by having a bunch of you know, community meetings and, and Frankly, there wasn't a lot of input in that process. It was just, we, we found the thing that was doing it, we banned it, you know, to use untechnical language, and then it stopped. And like, we, we were able to solve the problem, and I, I just don't know that, you know, a community input would have added anything. And it's, it's not like community input necessarily subtracts in every single instance, but we have reached the point where community input is clearly a delaying action and being used by bad faith actors and is not, to my mind, adding anything valuable to the process. So the simplest and easiest thing to do is to just fix the problem without the lengthy years long talking about it process. Um, if I could just respond yeah. both to that question and then my lefty friend over here. Um, I think like community input is not inherently bad like getting communities to be bought into what is in their community seems like it's probably good. And there are ways to do it that are more timely, that are more efficient, that are mutually beneficial. Um, Data for Progress has been doing a series of focus groups and workshops across the country and communities that are potentially gonna be sites for the direct air capture hubs that BIF authorized. And the focus of those workshops has been like, you know, one explaining what the hell DAC is, because a lot of people are like, we don't know what that looks like a fan. Um, and then also proposing, you know, community benefit agreements and sharing like in other cities, like if there's a multi-million dollar sports stadium that's being built, like that company will engage with the community and say like, what can we fund? What are investments you're interested in that we can support in order for this project to receive community support? And you know, communities want things like you know, funding an apprenticeship program, program at the community college. Like in another instance, it was like building a, a local community grocery store. Like these are good things that communities want that companies can and should be willing to engage in providing. And so you know, we should get community input. We should not allow community input to have a chokehold on our entire economy. Um, and I think community benefit agreements are a great way to get at that. And also, like, again, the question of who's community. Like, community to me is not the person who has the time and capacity to, like, go to community board meetings all the time and stir the pot. Um, that's not community to me. Um, and then to your question about, like, engaging folks on the left, if you have any ideas of how to do it better, I'm all ears. 
Um, I've been pretty disappointed by how kind of toxic the discourse has been, where I'm like, we need transmission, and then they're like, this is the white supremacist dirty side deal. <laughs> and I'm like, ah, how, how can we talk about this better? Um, and <laughs> again, I think the API watermark was a really bad start. Um, and I have been encouraged in talking to congressional staff on you know, some progressive offices, um, off the record, there is an acknowledgement and willingness to talk about the need to like make it easier to build things. I think, I think Senator Schatz has been a great voice for this. Um, but the political dynamics and coalition dynamics are extremely toxic on this issue. And I'm very much interested in exploring like how can we get an EJ perspective that's pro-building. And the you don't get that by saying, screw community input, like we don't need to hear these people. And if that's your perspective, that's fine. But you know, from a leftist perspective that values like how can we persuade these communities, I think there's real work to be done. And the last thing I'll say, sorry, I'm woman-splaining. Um, the polling shows that actual Democratic voters support permitting reform and are persuaded by messaging that talks about the imperative to build more quickly for climate. So this is an issue where I think political and democratic elites have a very like niche view that's out of step with actual Democratic Party voters. Yeah. So I'll address the, the quickly the, the procedure versus substantive. What, what could that look like, right? So what could we uh, trade, essentially, to, to, to uh, get NEPA uh, repealed? So like, to me, like a carbon tax would be a great idea, because a carbon tax uh, you know, promotes decarbonization uh, in the app, you know, just by itself, but it pr promotes it even better if you also pair it with an ability to build new infrastructure, right? So the way you, in the way you adjust to a carbon tax, uh, if it's just imposed, is like, okay, you consume like less carbon. Uh, you, you reduce your energy consumption, let's say, right? But if you can also substitute away, because we can build a lot more plants, then it's even more effective, right? Uh, but I think other things like, you know, air, uh, air, air pollution control measures, right? So like, so we ban two-stroke motors, right? Like on, on leaf blowers and stuff. They're terrible for air, air pollution, right? M2.5. Uh, yeah. Can we like try to do more rapid phase out of diesel, right? Like uh, you know, it's a big contributor to air pollution. Um, you know, there's there's a ton of there's a lot we could do, uh, and I don't know what the the set of substantive things that we would you know could, could cobble together to like get an agreement on. But I I would be very open to uh, more stringent substantive protections uh, in exchange for uh, procedural relief. And I think that's all the time we have. Thank you.